This recording um, looks at the bilaterian clade, and specifically the spiralia group. That term may end up being synonymous with Lophotrochozoans, but it's unclear right now if Lophotrochozoan is within the spiralia clade or if it's the same thing as the spiralia clade. It depends on um, where the organisms end up branching, um, which is uh, still under debate. So when we look at the bilaterian clade, they have um, these five characteristics amongst others. They all have true tissues which means they have real, true muscle and true nerves, uh, as well as other tissue types. They have bilateral symmetry, that's hence the name. They are triploblastic, which means they have a, a mesoderm during development. They have um, cephalization, that is when there are um, neurons concentrated, usually in the anterior part of the organism, sensory organs that are in the, primarily in the anterior part of the organism. So it's basically to moving towards or having a brain. Most of the bilateria have a, a coelom, a body cavity, as well as an alimentary canal, which just means a digestive tract with two openings instead of a gastrovascular cavity. There are two clades, and then within that there are other clades. So there's the deuterostomia, and then there's the protostomia, which has both the spiralia and the abdixozoa. So I guess really there's like three clades of bilateriates. So this is the clade spiralia. Here are our phyla and some basic descriptions of each of those. You can take a look at that just to get a general idea and we'll go through them one by one. So we're looking here in the spiralia group. I, I guess I'll point out that there's this acela or xenoacelomorpha group up here. They used to be grouped with the platyhelminthes because they're both kind of, they're dorsoventrally flattened, but they're actually quite different. We think that they're an early branching group so this is a platyhelminthes um, organism, but it's the same sort of thing in the acela group where they have no coelom in the inside, it's just um, all solid tissue, probably the first diverging in the bilateriates over here. Platyhelminthes, that's uh, the first one we talk about in our spiralia group. You'll notice that our spiralia does not have branching within the group. It's all, it's a polytomy here where they're all coming off the same. Obviously, they're not all branching at the same time. We're just not sure about the branching pattern, or at least not the whole thing. So for our purposes, to make it easier, we're just going to draw them all branching like that. So platyhelminthes are the flatworms. Um, they live in all kinds of environments, both marine and freshwater, as well as sometimes on damp land, like in soil. Um, they have multiple types of nutrition, the parasitic, and there's also ones that are free-living hunters. Um, they are acelomates, you can see here, no body cavity. They have a gastrovascular cavity, which means it's like the cnidarians, where they have a single opening, it's actually in the middle of their body, and then there's a cavity that does the digestion, and then all the leftover particles come back out that one opening. There are two main lineages of platyhelminthes, the catenulida, or chain worms, which we will not talk about. The other lineage is the Rabbitophthora. They're very diverse. Um, the three subgroups here, which we talk about in lab, are the free-living flatworms, the Trematoda group, um, really a class, and the Cestoda class. So here's some little descriptors. Um, we're calling the Turbolarians free-living flatworms. Turns out that the organisms that were all grouped together in this class are not actually all together. They spread throughout the different groups. So you might hear the word turbolaria, but it's not an accurate term anymore. However, um, some descriptors are nice. The trematoda and cestoda are still classes that are used. So here's our free-living flatworm. It's, we're going to call it a group of organisms. Here's a nice pretty um, version of that. So sometimes they're very colorful. This one's obviously living in the ocean. It's a polyphyletic group. That's why we don't call it a class anymore. Um, a classic example of those are planarians, so that's uh, Dugasia is the genus you have in the lab for those. They have um, cephalization, so they'll have a brain or clustered ganglia at their anterior end. Um, not a nerve net, they have these nerve cords, they have two of them, that run down their body and then have these transverse nerves that innervate the cells um, across the body. 
So a big advantage of having a centralized nervous system like this is that you can channel the information and have it flow through the nervous system uh, in order to really organize the kinds of movements and responses that the organism can have. We mentioned that with cephalization, there are sensory structures that tend to be concentrated anteriorly, and the flatworms, um, the free living flatworms, show that. So, not all of them have these, but these are this is planaria specifically. So, they have these structures here that look like googly eyes, but they're actually called ocelli, um, plural, ocellus is a singular. Um, in the ocellus, there are uh, pigmented cells that capture light and then photoreceptor. Um, that are cells that are going to be able to detect that light send the signal to the brain. So the, you'll see here that um, in a case where there's light and dark spots, the planarian will be able to sense the light in the dark and move towards the dark side. So that's um, one example of uh, a sensory stimulus causing a, a response. The planarian does not see pictures like we do, images, it just can sense light and dark. There are also these things called auricles. They're these little flaps on the side of the head. They are really chemo detectors. That's how I'd like you to describe them for chemo detection. It just means detection of chemicals in the environment. So for us, some chemo detection kind of um, processes like smell for us is chemo detection. Taste is a kind of chemo detection. I mentioned that they have a gastrovascular cavity, right? One opening, and it's actually right here, um, like in the middle of the organism. And then the gastrovascular cavity is very highly branched with lots of surface area, which makes a lot of sense because that acts as both the digestion cavity as well as the circulation. So every cell has to get its nutrients from the gastrovascular cavity. There's no like, there's no um, tubes for it to go through or bloodstream or anything like that. So um, it must be transported from the cavity into the cells and then possibly from one cell to another, but it can't go too far. It's also an um, advantage or one reason they can do that is because they're so flat that there's not a lot of cell layers thick to go through. Um, they don't have any gas exchange organs specifically. They just diffuse through their skin because they're so flat they're able to do that as well. The oxygen can get into the cells and the carbon dioxide can diffuse out of those cells into the environment. Excretory system wise, they also use um, diffusion to get rid of the nitrogenous wastes. So this is wastes that are nitrogen based. They're from breakdown of um, nucleic acids as well as proteins. Those both have nitrogen groups in them. And so they have to be gotten rid of because they're toxic to the organism. So um, then the osmotic balance. So this means that you know, it's uh, the regulation of water content in the organism. Free living flatworms live in both freshwater and saltwater. They're going to have to have osmoregulatory mechanisms. Osmoregulatory mechanisms allow animals um, to maintain homeostasis in an environment. So homeostasis is a steady state. So it doesn't mean that it's not completely changing, and it doesn't mean like equal or balanced. It just means within a certain range. So for example, you have an automatic um, thermostat and the thermostat set at a certain point. When the room gets too hot, uh, the heater turns off and the room gets cooler. When the room gets too cold, the heater turns on and the room gets warmer. So it keeps it at that step, set point and that's what homeostasis does. So there's two main ways that animals respond to environmental fluctuation to um, maintain homeostasis. So there's regulators that are going to control the fluctuation in the face of external fluctuation. So they stay, for example, body temperature, they're going to stay really pretty constant no matter what the outside temperature is. So their homeostatic um, range is very small. The conformers, like this fish here, they actually, their body temperature changes with the um, outside environment. And that whole range is still their homeostatic conditions. It's just that they're conformers, and so they'll change with the environment. So we see this kind of thing with um, osmo, with water processes. Um, osmo conformers um, are isoosmotic with the surroundings, which means their body uh, concentration in their body cells is the same as the concentration in the external environment. So they um, 
use processes to maintain their internal concentrations osmotic that are isoosmotic to the external. Then they don't have to have any regulation because their fluids are the same as the environment. So like you talked about with cellular transport and bio one, when they're isotonic or isoosmotic, there's no overall water movement. So the organisms don't explode from getting too much water or shrivel up and die from not having enough. Osmoregulators, their cells are not the same concentration as the environment. So whether they have more solute or less solute depends on the environment they're in. So what they're going to have to do is use energy to get rid of or uptake uh, or retain more water. And so that's one thing that these flatworms can do. They osmoregulate. There are all these spread throughout their body, all these tubules called protonephridia. So this is what the tubule looks like, and on the ends of these, or branching off, we have things called flame bulbs. The flame bulb has these cilia projecting down into it that are going to um, wave around, and the water gets pulled into the flame bulb. Um, the cilia moves that water and filters it, and this water is coming from interstitial fluid, I should say. So this is the fluid that's all around the body tissues. And that's going to come down, and there's a, an opening. So any of the uh, excess fluid will be swept down and then go out the opening in the body wall and basically be released out of the uh, flatworm. Reproduction, they can both, uh, planarian can reproduce sexually and asexually. Um, different flatworms have different mechanisms. For the planaria, they can actually stick their tail onto a surface and swim away and break off a piece of their body, and that body will regrow a head, uh, or if it's, you know, the head, the tail's cut off, it'll regrow the tail and it can become a completely new worm. Here is the first class of flatworms. They're called Trematoda. They are the flukes. That's a common name for them. There are many types of flukes. One, for example, is a blood fluke. Um, the flukes are animal parasites, so they live in different types of animals. Um, a lot of them have relatively complex life cycles. Well, they'll, they'll have one stage of their life in one animal host and another stage in a different host, sometimes up to three or four different hosts, to complete their life cycle. They have suckers to attach to the host, and then they are basically um, reproductive organs in large part otherwise. So there's really nice life cycle information about um, a number of different flukes in the lab atlas, so take a look at those. The last group of flatworms, the class Cestoda, are the tapeworms. They are also parasitic. They live in digestive tracts of the vertebrates. They're quite long, and they basically have sort of two functions. One is to hold on to the intestine, and the other one is to reproduce. So their body's made of all these small units, and each unit in it has reproductive parts, and that's pretty much it. Um, all the way at the anterior end, this is what the scolex is. Uh, it has both um, suckers and hooks, or some one or the other, depends on the type of tapeworm. There are many tapeworm species. But those are all going to help it hold on to the intestine. If you were to pull a tapeworm out of um, an animal without detaching it or killing it really. What happens is you just break off these little proglottids, the structures here, and um, it'll just grow new ones. So unless you can kill it, um, which they can do with drugs, but unless you can kill it, you really can't get it completely out by just pulling the tapeworm out. It doesn't have any digestive system, um, not surprising because it lives in the intestine where the animal has already digested its food, so it can just absorb the that pre-digested food across its body wall. The reproductive organs mature down the body. So the ones that are most posterior are um, the most mature, and so they're ripe with eggs. Those eggs will be uh, released, and then they can pass out of the host to go on and infect someone else if they ingest those feces. So that's the platyhelminthes. Very quickly about rotifers, they are small. Um, 0.5 to 2 millimeters, so very small. They live in marine, freshwater, and damp soil. They have these cilia around their mouth um, that allow them to pull food into their bodies. They have a complete digestive tract. I'll show you that here. Here's their mouth, and there's their anus. So it's um, two openings, one in and one out. 
and um, they're pseudocelomates where they don't have a, mesoter a mesoderm lined um, gut tube. They actually reproduce by parthenogenesis, so where there's only females and their eggs can just grow into new um, rotifers without having to have fertilization with the sperm. So since they're so small, they basically move the fluid around their body and can do gas exchange as well as nutrient exchange with the environment and with um, cell to cell. So why would this alimentary canal, the two openings, be adaptive? Well, um, this one's pretty simple. But if you imagine, we can actually have specialization along the canal. So as the food goes down the canal, different processes can happen to it at different times, which makes it much more efficient. So you can have intake in one structure, mechanical digestion somewhere else, then along the lines, chemical digestion, absorption, and then ex excretion um, all in their own little region. So that makes it a lot more efficient. Now let's move on to these two groups, the ectoprocta, they're also known as bryozoans, or, and the brachiopoda. Ectoprocta have a bunch of different forms, but they, um, a lot of times, especially when they're um, dried, they look like moss, so we call them moss animals. And um, what you're really seeing when they're dried as specimens, you don't, you see their um, external secreted shell, basically. And um, they're really important for uh, helping b or part of coral reefs. They are colonial, so all these are different organisms, but they live together in colonies. They have ciliated tentacles around this mouth structure, a uh, U-shaped digestive tract, which is unique to ectoprocta and brachiopoda. Um, this exoskeleton they secrete, like I mentioned, and they don't have a head, though, um, but we still count them as bilaterians because they are bilaterally symmetrical. The brachiopoda are also known as lamp shells, so they have a long stalk. Neither of these, you can really see the stalk, but they have a long stalk that's attached to a surface, and then they have the shell, and inside of it they have this, um, the ciliated tentacles around their mouth, just like the ectoprocta has, and um, a U-shaped digestive system. Their shell is different than something like a clam or a mussel, which is a, a bivalve mollusk. It's different because the shells here are the dorsal ventral, meaning the back and belly of the organism versus the left and the right, which is how a clam's shells are, their left side and right side. So here's a schematic of number of different organ systems and how they interact with each other. Not every animal has all these organ systems, in, especially in this kind of structure, but um, here are sort of the ways they interact. So here is, this is a, the digestive system. This one is a complete alimentary canal. Um, the digestive system absorbs nutrients and transports them, if the organism has it, to a circulatory system. So um, that can be open or closed, but here it has um, a pump, the circulatory system. The circulatory system is responsible for bringing the nutrients to all the other cells in the body. Respiratory systems, um, sometimes they are uh, structures, they're usually structures with lots of surface area. They're going to be responsible for taking in oxygen and releasing the carbon dioxide. They bring in that car uh, oxygen and dump it into the circulatory system, and the carbon dioxide comes out of the circulatory system and is released through the respiratory system. Then we have the inter interchange between the interstitial fluid and the circulatory system. So that's where you're having water um, going in and out. Um, if there's too much water in the body cells, more is going to go into the circulatory system. It'll get dumped into the urinary system or the excretory system where that gets excreted from the body. Um, nitrogenous waste products from the body cells will also get excreted there. And um, so this helps with water balance and well as getting rid of nitrogenous waste. So the type of circulatory system shown here is called a closed circulatory system. That's one of the types. Um, it's going to have a muscular pump or uh, we call it a heart frequently. So it has the circulatory fluid and completely contained in vessels. We call the fluid blood in closed circulatory systems. There may be more than one heart to pump that blood, and we see these kinds of systems in the um, Numerita, which we didn't talk 
about, but those are the proboscis worms or ribbon worms, annelids, the segmented worms, most um, cephalopod type mollusks, so that's octopus, or squid, cuttlefish, nautilus, those groups. You see it in vertebrates. So here's a, a picture. So here's the pump, the heart, the blood's going to go around. Um, each organ has small vessels that are around it and that's where the exchange occurs and then any um, uh, products can get picked up and dropped off and then that goes back around and get pumped again and just keeps circulating. So mollusks um, are a large group which we'll talk about now. They're in the spiralia still. Lots of different examples, lots of different body forms. They all do have some basic structures though that are similar. Ones I've marked with stars are the classification criteria, so all mollusks have those parts. Most of them are coelomates. Um, they all have a muscular foot. Uh, sometimes it's modified, but it's used for movement of some sort. They have what we call a visceral mass, which is shown here in the orange, but it's the part of their body where all their organs are found. There's a mantle, which in this case lies right under the shell. So the mantle will make the shell if there is a shell present, and that counts like a type of exoskeleton. Um, many of the mollusks have open circulatory systems, except for the uh, cephalopods have closed ones. And then many of them also have radulas, which help them scrape up their food here, uh, but that's not completely consistent. So the types of mollusks that have the open circulatory system, so that's going to be things like snails, slugs, clams, mussels, oysters. It has a heart, which acts as a pump, and it has some vessels, but those vessels don't connect to each other. Um, they just dump into the body cavity. So we don't call their fluid blood, we call it hemolymph, because it's a mixture of um, body fluid, interstitial fluid, as well as the circulatory fluid, it's all the same. So the hemolymph gets pumped um, through these kind of drains into the heart and then it'll get pumped to the rest of the body. And as it does that, it'll pick up oxygen and drop off carbon dioxide and, and circulate nutrients, but it just doesn't stay completely contained the whole time. So insects and other arthropods, so that's like crustaceans as well, um, and things like spiders and um, millipedes, centipedes, scorpions, that sort of group, they um, have circulatory, open circulatory systems, and like I mentioned, many of the mollusks also do. Many mollusks have gills um, in order to do gas exchange. Some have modified um, mantles that have uh, lung function, like snails that live on land and slugs that live on land, um, but that's a gas exchange structure. So gas exchange structures, their job is to take oxygen from the environment and get rid of carbon dioxide to the environment. So there's always diffusion of, across a membrane. So remember, these gases travel from high to low, and they go straight across the membrane without any kind of transport help. But as long as they're going from high to low, that's the direction they move. So in the air, if an organism lives out in the air, they're going to have concerns about um, water loss. So those surface area easy to get oxygen in, oxygen has a lot of, uh, air has a lot of oxygen in it, but um, the water also evaporates. So those are some kinds of systems that have arisen to um, be adapted to living in air, our lungs, and using the skin if you can keep it moist enough, and the tracheal system of insects. In the water, the problem is that the oxygen level is low. So um, you're looking at adaptations here to improve respiration like better at extracting oxygen from the water. But you don't see a lot of problems with water loss because they're in the water already. So a gills, that's a common structure for extracting oxygen from water and getting rid of carbon dioxide to the water. Here's an example of an annelid with these parapodium structures. So they stick off the body, they're little fleshy features here. Those are the gas exchange structures in this annelid, it lives in the water. Uh, here is an example in a deuterostome, specifically sea star, you cut that open, you'll see all these surface areas in pink, those are all gills, and so that's where it does its gas exchange. So these are some common respiratory structures that you'd see in water environments. Mollusks are a really nice example of a sensory organ that's very complex, and we can kind of trace its evolution through the different groups. So it's the eye, the, 
the lens, single lens eye, which is like camera um, focusing. But And we talked about this, I think, in a different chapter with evolution. Uh, but we can see that um, some mollusks have just pigmented photoreceptors. Some have those into a cup. Um, then you'll see fluid-filled cavities, lenses, um, and then lenses and cornea on top that can uh, change uh, diameter. And so um, this is a pretty nice array of um, stages of eye development. And obviously the limpet is still very successful today. So it's not like this pigmented patch of cells went away in time because it got more complicated. It's just that the group that had pigmented cells went on their, you know, merry way. And then other groups diverged and ended up with different kinds of structures that were adapted to other types of environments and behaviors. So here are our four groups, our four classes of mollusks. You'll definitely need to know organisms in each class and the names and all that stuff and the general characteristics. We can go through them one by one. So the polyplacophora, they're called chitons. Um, they are oval shaped. They have eight dorsal plates. That's their um, characteristic feature. They have their uh, foot on the bottom side underneath those plates. They use it for crawling slowly across the rocks. And they have that radula, which they can scrape algae off the rocks, and that's what they eat. Then we have the group that contains slugs and snails. They're called gastropoda class. Gastro means stomach, and poda means foot. So these are stomach foots. So snails and slugs, limpets, abalone, we have an abalone shell. Um, those are all gastropods. They have a single shell, if at all. Slugs do not. They've lost their shell. And a lot of times it's a, it's a um, spiral shell. Not always, though. They live all over the place, freshwater and saltwater, as well as living on land. Um, the ones that live on land have a modified mantle cavity that acts as a lung. The ones that live in water typically have um, gills, particularly the slugs. So you can see here, these structures here, those are the gill structures of this um, nudibranch, which is a type of sea slug, and they would do gas exchange in the water. Many of the gastropods have undergone torsion, which is a kind of interesting thing where um, you end up with the mouth and the anus kind of close together. So instead of the mouth on one side and the anus all the way on the other, during development, that twists around, and so you end up getting the anus sort of like on top of the head, almost, of, um, that's where the unprocessed waste would come out. Um, and so it's like back forward towards the, towards the interior again. They have uh, distinct heads and eyes, and they also use the radula to eat the algae or other types of plant material. Uh, there are predatory um, gastropods, so there's some snails that are, um, cone snails in particular, they're very aggressive predators. They drill holes in um, shells of other organisms or, and or sting them with um, major toxins. And they will uh, be their carnivorous and they hunt. Um, and they're very successful predators. These are the group with two shells. So you can see two examples there. We call them bivalvia for bivalves. So a valve is a half a shell. So they have two halves. They're clams, mussels, scallops, oysters, that kind of group. Um, those shells are hinged, so they'll open and shut and stay together on the one side. They are suspension feeders um, where they filter the food particles out of the water. Um, they're going to use their foot, which you can see here, here, for um, digging into the sand and burying themselves and anchoring themselves down. Um, so they do move, but they're not super mobile. So they do move, but they're not super motile. Um, so this is a picture of a clam, which is similar, or which is, so we either dissect a clam or a mussel, which is very similar. And you'll notice it has a gill. Gills are used for both getting um, oxygen, getting rid of carbon dioxide, as well as um, capturing food particles that that can then be passed across to the mouth of the clam. There's the heart. So it is an open circulatory system. Um, where the heart does pump into vessels, but those vessels just dump into the body. Then they drain back into the heart. The fourth group of mollusks, um, represented here by a nautilus and a squid, are called the cephalopods, or cephalopoda class. So this means head foot. They are very fast predators. Um, squids, octopuses, nautiluses, and cuttlefish are all in this group. Um, 
the octopus actually doesn't swim the same way like a, a squid does where it shoots water off a siphon and sort of propels itself forward. Um, octopus mostly creeps on the floor. Uh, it can move more quickly when it threatened. They have large brains, um, very sophisticated behavior, sophisticated defense and predatory mechanisms. They can, I mean, there's evidence, especially with the octopus, that they can learn. Uh, they have very complex eyes that are camera lens. Um, the Nautilus, you can see it has a shell here. The squid has a little shell inside, and then the octopus doesn't have a shell at all. It's completely soft-bodied. They do have a closed circulatory system, which the other mollusks do not. This makes sense, though, that allows them to have their lifestyle, because the movement that they make and the predatory lifestyle requires a lot of energy. Circulatory, closed circulatory systems are more efficient at distributing nutrients as well as um, gas exchange than an open circulatory system, which would allow um, less energy to be used on that and more energy to be retained and made for um, pred predation. So I'm going to post some videos of cephalopods that I'd like you to watch. They're really quite interesting. They have um, they're able to like uh, change color and texture of their skin. They can make their skin flash, uh, like like looks like um, Las Vegas lights almost that kind of thing um, for both predation as well as to um, escape being a uh, prey. Um, and they're they're really quite interesting. So you can see here the um, the uh, cephalopods. They're going to have these really more sophisticated brains and additional concentration of ganglia, whereas um, the um, less motile mollusks like clams and chitons, they have uh, ganglia as well, but not really a brain structure uh, and a bunch of longitudinal nerve cords. So this difference in nerve structure here matches their lifestyle. Mollusks are really in trouble. If we look at the rate of extinction of different animal species, you see mollusks are almost 50% of the uh, organisms we know of that have gone extinct, um, animals that we know of that have gone extinct. Some of that is because their skin is really thin and does a lot of exchange with the environment. So any type of, type of environmental toxins or chemicals or you know, uh, bacteria or whatever that's out there um, can really affect them a lot more because they are so dependent on their skin and they do take so much of the environment into their bodies. So we really worry about that. Um, mollusks are important um, in a large degree. There even are drugs that have been found um, like off the coast of the Philippines, there's lots of diversity there, including a bunch of mollusks, different types of snails, and we've um, extracted different chemicals from those snails and we use them today uh, in medicine. And so there's, there's things like that that you might not think of, of why it would be important to care that mollusks are going extinct at a really fast rate. All right, the last group of Spiralia are the annelids. They live, again, in many different environments. Um, most of them live in freshwater, but they can also live in damp soil, like the earthworm, and in the sea. Uh, here are some examples of different um, segmented worms. Annelida means little rings. So you can see, though, very clearly there's segments, and each segment has some repeating types of structures. Um, there's two major clades, the Arantia and the Sedentaria. We used to split it up differently, but then it turns out that we think that organisms we clump together are actually divided all over the place. Um, so right now we're just talking about this in the terms of clades for molecular evidence. Um, the clades have mixed characteristics. There's nothing like specifically that, oh, all the Arantia have this and all the Sedentaria have that. That's really molecularly that they clearly split into two groups. But Arantia in general are mo mo more mobile. They're going to be the ones that swim. Um, they frequently have these parapodia for gas exchange, that's these fleshy parts sticking off the body, uh, and then they might also have these chiti, um, or chita singular, bristles here, which can be used for um, uh, movement as well. The sedentaria tend to be less mobile, however, leeches and earthworms are in that group, um, so they, those obviously move. They uh, can live in tubes, so tube worms, uh, like this Christmas tree worm here. And uh, those are also, you can see it's segmented there, um, but those would be in the sedentaria group. 
So using the earthworm as an example, let's look at some of the structures. Like I mentioned, there's segmented segmentation. We see it come up um, repeatedly in different groups. And so the segmentation allows them to have a lot more flexibility and mobility. They have a true coelom, so they have empty space and a mesoderm-lined gut tube. Um, they have a, that, that coelom acts as the hydrostatic skeleton, so it's fluid-filled, and that's the, how they um, contract their muscles and gives them body shape, cushions their organs. This is how an earthworm crawls, um, so it's called peristalsis. You might have heard that term for how your food goes down your esophagus. And uh, so it's basically a combination of contractions of circular muscles and longitudinal muscles. And um, it's this ripple sort of effect. It's moving to the right. And um, you can sort of see, you'll see the bulge of the body move along as the worm crawls. Those CD are um, little projections, they're very small, but they give the worm traction so that it can crawl, um, usually in the soil, uh, so it has something to push against. Annelids have centralized nervous system, um, simpler than like a cephalopod, but they do have ganglia in their anterior area. Um, then they have this ventral nerve cord, so it runs along the belly side, and um, then they have nerves off of that that innervate the different muscles um, in each of the segments. So you can actually see segment, 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 segment. And so it has that repeating pattern in the ventral nerve cord as well. It's a complete digestive tract, so there's a mouth and an anus on the other end. Uh, it's really quite separated into different um, functional areas. So we have the mouth, and then there's the pharynx, um, then the esophagus. Then we get to the crop and the gizzard. Can't totally see the separate. Here you can see the separate. So the crop is where the food sort and softened, and then the gizzard in this case is where the food is is uh, ground up mechanically. Um, so there's uh, grinding structures inside of the gizzard. Then we go to the intestine, which is quite long. That's where absorption happens. Um, and then excretion at the anus. So that's a nice complete digestive system and alimentary canal. Closed circulatory system. So this is a uh, Different, all the annelids have closed circulatory systems like the cephalopods do and the mollusks. Um, and there's those five hearts in the earthworm, at least. And you can see all the blood is contained in these blood vessels. There's one that runs on the back, the dorsal blood vessel and the ventral blood vessel, and then this connectors um, all along the body. As far as uh, excretory system goes, um, these have metanephridia. In each segment, there's this cluster of tubules. So here's the capillaries. Those are really small blood vessels. And they're all entwined around this um, tubules of the metanephridium. That's in yellow. And so there's exchange between the capillaries and the interstitial fluid and then the um, metanephridia where um, wastes are nitrogenous wastes go from the blood into the nephridia as well as excess water and then eventually those are excreted through these external openings into the environment. So this is um, a way that the earthworm would be able to uh, get rid of nitrogenous waste without losing a lot of water as well as regulating the amount of water um, with this kind of exchange system. So you'll note that here's an example of the metanephridium here and it's in each little segment. Not all annelids are hermaphrodites, but earthworms are. Um, they still cross-fertilize, and here's the process by which that happens. Uh, you have some annelids that actually can um, regenerate um, asexually. So in this video, we'll see um, two earthworms. They're both hermaphroditic, but they're exchanging sperm. There's a smooth part of their body called a clitellum, and that's where this exchange happens. Um, yeah, you'll see there's the clitellum on one worm and there's the uh, clitellum on the other worm. And then they store the sperm inside these little sacs and then they release it to fertilize the eggs inside their body and then they will um, 
excrete the fertilized eggs and then a, a cocoon forms around that. Um, then the, the, the mucus comes out of their clitellum, slides down their body, and the cocoon falls off the end of their tail, basically. And then, then the uh, worms develop there, and then they'll hatch out of the cocoon. So you might hear this term polychaete, but we're not really using it anymore because the polychaetes are all over the place as far as molecular evidence goes. So I were using Arantia and Sedentaria now, but in any case, that's where that word is, comes from. Uh, one of the groups besides earthworms that are in the Sedentaria, uh, and some of those tube worms as well, are the leeches. So um, they are, we think of them as the blood-sucking ones, but there's actually, most of them are free-living carnivores that eat um, other invertebrates. Um, but the ones that do suck blood, they have like a, a razor in their um, jaws, and that can slit open their... Um, the prey's skin, um, they secrete an anesthetic, so you don't actually usually feel that very much, and then they secrete herudin, which is an anticoagulant, so it prevents the blood from clotting. We actually can, uh, we've taken the herudin gene and put it into um, uh, different vectors, something like E. coli, in the lab, and we can use that to make a lot of herudin protein. And um, by doing that bioengineering, we can take that herudin and give it to people with blood clots and uh, help dissolve their blood clots more uh, readily. When they're sucking the blood, they can suck up to 10 times their original weight in blood, so they just get huge. Um, then they don't have to eat for months after that. Um, there also are leeches, like this one in the picture, where they're used medically in order to, um, uh, if part of your finger or toe comes off and then they've sewn it back on. Sometimes they'll put a leech on the end of it to try to get that blood flowing back into that sewn on body part. Um, they were used very extensively in medicine in the past, in the 1800s and before, um, for bloodletting. We don't really do that anymore. Um, but they are back in use for some purposes like this. Okay, so that's your uh, Spiralia group of the bilaterians, and um, there's just one more group in the bilaterians. They are called the Dictozoa, and we will see those on another lecture.